church. How's everybody doing this morning? Good? Good. I'm glad you're here. Hey, today, uh, and, and hey to everybody online. Like sometimes if you see me just staring off into space, for those that are here, I'm looking at the camera a little bit and just making eye contact with people at home. But I'm glad you guys are all here today. Um, today's kind of like a best of days, you know, a great day, and it's a tough day, all in the same, the same uh, hand, you know. Number one, it's an awesome day because we have four people stepping up to getting baptized, so that's awesome. Excited for that. Um, yeah, and we're excited about that, and we're glad that we can continue in that. Um, and then the hard thing is, if you guys know, if, you've been, if you have friends and family in the medical field or you've been seeing on the news, like Mercy Hospital in Muskegon is, as Brian said, slammed. You know what I mean? They're at capacity. We have friends and j partners that work there, and you've seen some of their posts about the reality of what's going on. And I think, you know, for some of us, you know, last March and April, it was hard to wrap our mind around what was going on, and now it's like really close to home. And so as you know, we've made some changes to our services for the next three to four weeks, all, really until every 12th, which is December 6th. And on Dece December 6th, instead of having church, we're going to go out and so we're still going to plan on doing that. And then hopefully, Lord willing, December 13th, we will get back to normal. But we're going to keep you guys posted on that. And we're going to stay up to date on that. And the heart behind that wasn't that anybody really told us to. We, um, our elders got together and we got together with other churches too and prayed about what they're doing and looking at the healthcare system. And we landed on, you know, Jesus tells us to love our neighbors. And right now, for a portion of Muskegon, like they're struggling. And so thank you guys for like wearing your mask while you're moving around the building here today. And, um, you know, again, I, like I said a couple weeks ago, it was never my intention to go into ministry to help have people wear masks <laughs> or to police masks. But it's just something that, you know, we're doing right now. So thank you guys for your patience in that. And thank you guys for everybody online. We appreciate you guys tuning in and watching. Um, I have a few things. I have kind of this sermon's kind of broken up into two parts, but I felt like the first part we should talk about what the next four weeks will look like. And my challenge to you guys as a church um, that are watching here in person or you online is how we should function the next four weeks or longer if by chance things get worse. Like wh what is our role and where do we go from here? Because I will say this, the last time there was these shutdowns, as you guys remember in March and April, like I think we were all kind of shocked and not super prepared to how to be the church in that time. And for a lot of us, we went like totally virtual and totally at home church and we didn't do much for a season and for some of us like our ministry stopped as well and it just kind of had to or we didn't know how to figure out how to continue in ministry and so everything kind of paused and then it was like getting back into it. it was like a struggle again and so you know i think god wants us to adapt during this time you know adapt and figure out how so um we're again we're gonna go week by week we are our missional communities are still, we're not making any changes. Like some missional communities are making some changes, but we're asking them to keep meeting and meeting safely in a way that makes sense. Some are going digital for a period of time, but we're asking those to keep going and to keep meeting because if we're just watching at home, which is fine, and we're not doing missional community and we don't, we're not doing discipleship in any way, then like, then we fall into what we call like isolation. And we feel like that's not healthy either. And even if it's Zoom or phone conversations, discipleship has to keep happening as a church. And discipleship has to be keep happening. And so we want to be more than just the, the thing. So we're also starting some Zoom missional communities, which a missional community here is our way of doing small groups. And so we get together. So if you're interested in joining a Zoom missional community, go to the mission card. You can scan it by scanning those codes in front of you. Excuse me. <clears throat> if you're not signed up for a missional community, sign up that way, and we'll get you plugged in. Also, if you are at home and you do have no way to scan the um, card, you can text the words mission card to 31996, and it'll text you a link to sign up for that Zoom MC. So we believe it's important. We believe it's important to stay involved in the body of Christ. Stay connected in the body. As I sent out an email, I said this. You know, Jesus used the term for the church— as the body, like the body of Christ. Like we're the body. Like some of you all are going to be the hands. Like we all have different functions. Some of you are going to be the feet. Some of you are the mouth. You know, some of you 
are the hair. I don't know if God, you know, if, but we all are part of the body. We all have a specific role. Keep the head warm, I guess, would be the hair's role. Um, and we're all part of the body. And what I say all that is because we got to stay connected to the body. And I say all that for here and everybody at home as well. Like, we got to stay connected. And in the same way, heaven forbid, if any of you accidentally cut your finger off, you know what they say to do? It's like, put it on ice and go to the hospital as soon as possible. <laughs> because your finger, unattached from your body, won't only last so long before it dies. <laughs> and I know that's a graphic example, but I think Jesus used these examples of the body to show if you separate the hand from the body for too long, like, we struggle spiritually. And some of us are just like, we, we struggle, and, and it's, it's a struggle. And so we're saying, like, don't be separated from the body for too long, or you're going to feel the consequences in different ways. Don't fall into isolation. And what we talked about before is isolation is one of Satan's, like, biggest tools, is to get people isolated and get people off on their own without community. So I think as this is during this time of taking a break, or even if, Lord willing, if we don't have to do this, but if the state goes into some sort of lockdown or your works go into some sort of lockdowns, you will either grow closer to Jesus or you will grow farther away from Jesus. The, really, the choice is yours. Nothing can make you fall away from God or Jesus. It's your commitment and your heart to follow him. During this time, if you're going to grow and be stronger at the end of this, or if it's just took you out, right? Like it's either going to make you stronger or take you out, and it's, it's really about your dependency on God. You know, many churches right now are doing the live stream, because as I said, we have the, I have the privilege of kind of like getting to know a lot of pastors in Muskegon, and a lot of the ones that I'm friends with just went totally virtual, some to like January, or some for like a season, and, and they, they're doing it to help slow the spread of the virus and help out the hospital systems. And so they live stream the message, and that's good. But sometimes the message we give the churches, and I want to be careful, I want to say this, is just watch, like, your faith is watching an hour from home each week. And if that's the message we're sending as a church, we're sending the wrong message. Because as you know, one of our values here at Jericho Road Church is go out and be the church, right? Like, this here is a, like, a pep rally to get us all excited to go out and be the church the rest of the week. And so whether we go on lockdown or we don't or whatever, and we, or whether you're at home and we watch for a season at home, like, church has got to be more than watching, like, a screen for an hour a week. Or even for you guys here, it's got to be more than just sitting in a pew for an hour a week. And if that's where your faith begins and ends, it's like time to like figure out what Jesus has for us because he wants us to be the church. And church and our faith is not just being present for one hour a week. He has a bigger plan for us. And so if we are, like again, we're going virtual for a period of time or semi-virtual, there's like three ways that you could interact with that. The first is, is to worship. Like again, so much of the live stream just by nature during this pandemic time is consumeristic. It's like, I'll get on, consume what the church offers, and then I'm done for the week. Like, it's got to be so much more than that. And so during this time, whether you're in person or at home, is there's three things you could do. You could worship. And so if you're at home, I know worshiping at home is sort of weird, but I worship at home by myself sometimes in my quiet time, or maybe my wife and I will worship, or you guys all did it in the last pandemic time where we worshiped at home when we did those Wednesday night live streams. And that's hard at first, and it's hard. But really, worship isn't about you. It's about bringing praise to our Father. Amen? It's not really about, like, us or checking off a box. It's about glorifying God because we were all created to worship God. We were all created to worship God. And so when you're at home, like, good way is, like, practice singing along with the songs and going into the spirit of worship even if you're at home. And even people present, you know, we have that struggle too. <laughs> you know, sing, you know, lift up your voices. Praise is actually making a noise with your voice to praise God. Some of us, it's a joyful noise. If you're like me, it's a not so joyful noise. But that's why I sit up front so nobody could hear me singing, all right, except for the people on stage. 
Um, so the first is worship. Second is discipleship. Discipleship is still going to happen throughout the week with our missional communities and other things. Some of you are in discipleship relationships, and those are great. Also, parents, um, Jackie Carlson, our kids' ministry director, is sending out resources. And that's a great opportunity, parents, to talk to your kids about things of faith. And some of us aren't used to that habit, but we got to get into the habit as parents to sit down because— pandemic or no pandemic, it's the parents' responsibility to disciple their kids. Again, Sunday morning is just a vitamin, but you guys are offering the main discipleship at home. And so when your kids go to bed, when your kids wake up, when your kids are around there, use the resources Jackie is giving you to teach your kids about Jesus and share Jesus with them. And life change. What you hear in the next four weeks, if you're watching from home or you come in person, it could be a consume, like, I, I liked what the pastor had to say. That could be, like, consumeristic. Like, I went to Taco Bell, and I really liked the chalupa I had. That was good. But if you go and listen to the pastor's sermon and say, I think God has a message for me today, I'm going to listen and figure out what that message is and figure out how I, could, how I could apply it to my life. There's a very difference there. If you look at it like he's serving something, I'm going to listen to it and think, oh, he did a good job— that could fall on the consumeristic side. If you listen to say, hey, we're reading God's word, and I believe God has a message for me, so I'm going to figure out what that is, and I want to try to live it out, that's where life change happens. Again, I want to encourage us to go on this next season, because the reality is we're praying that we can go back to normal on December 13th, and the reality is we don't know. Like, I'm not trying to be a Debbie Downer, but I, we don't know. Like, I didn't think we'd have to make any changes in September. Um, and so, but I believe the church is equipped to be the church, whether we're full bore or not. Like, we really have to be, and, and we really have to be more than the Sunday morning thing. So we can't fall into that trap. God has a plan for you in this season. All of you here, God has a plan for you in this season. And what the enemy will cause for harm, like the pandemic and isolating the church and just getting you to be isolated from everybody else— what, God, what Satan calls for harm, that God can use for good. God can use this time to help you grow closer to him and do ministry in a way that you've never done. God can use the next four weeks to strengthen the church. To strengthen the church in a big way. And that we come out the way, the other side, a lot stronger than we were before. And so, if we think that all of this stuff that's happening is only going to harm the church, we have a short-sighted because God said initially, you know, Peter, on you, I will build my, my church on you. I'll build my church on this rock, and the gates of hell will not prevail. And so he's saying the church cannot be hindered. It just has to adapt. Like, we really have to adapt as a church and figure out how we can be the church in these different times. Right? Amen? So there's a couple of ways— that we could do that. Number one, we need to fellowship during this time. I get that fellowship is a really churchy word, and some of you that are here might not be familiar with the churchy word fellowship, but it's part of the body. And when we get with other Christians, we are experiencing fellowship, where we ask, how are you doing? How can I pray for you? You know, are you, like, encouraging one another? You know, pointing out sin if we see it, and, and lovingly correcting if we see it, and challenging. And like, fellowship has to keep happening. And fellowship can't happen, again, just sitting here on Sunday morning or just on watching TV. It can't. Like, it has to be more than that. And you are designed for fellowship. We are designed to live in community as a church. So again, here's my challenge. If you are not in a missional community, um, if you are in one, great. Find a way to gather safely in our missional community leaders. Like, gather safely in a, in a way that's, you know, not just going to, like, continue to spread needlessly when we don't have to. Um, and if you need to gather digitally, like, gather digitally on Zoom. If you're not in an MC, sign up for one on the mission card and sign up for a missional community. We'll get you in one or get you in a digital one so we can keep meeting and, and keep doing that. If you don't feel like right now is a good time to do any MC or do a digital MC or come to church— like, my last plea is, like, find a Christian that you're close with and ask to meet, like, once a week, right? If you're not going to church, if you're not going to MC, like, we need to have some type of interaction. And I feel like that's where we missed it the last time. 
And some of us just got so isolated, it had big effects on us spiritually and physically and emotionally and mentally. Like, we just went into, like, a deep isolation, and that was not good for the body. And we can still have fellowship. Like, like I said, I know that some of us, you know, during this time where the hospitals are going crazy, like, we don't want to just needlessly gather and, and not be safe about it. But there's nothing that says you can't talk on the phone with somebody and ask how you're doing, right? Like, there's nothing, like, the virus, as far as I know, can't, cannot spread over the phone or through Zoom, so it costs nothing, and it's no risk to pick up the phone and, and ask how somebody's doing or have an hour conversation once a week to edify each other and build each other up. And sometimes with the virus, we made excuses for not being the church. And there's like, God's like, there's other ways. I've given you these tools, even though I'm not a personally a big fan of Zoom. We do it. Guess what? I'm a pastor, and for 13 years, yesterday, I did a wedding over Zoom for a couple. Right? Did you guys hear about that or see it? It's a Jericho Road person. Amanda Martin, by the way. She probably wouldn't care if I told you guys. Amanda Martin got married yesterday. Yeah, yeah. Good job. Did you start that clap, Bruce? Good job, Bridget. Thank you. <laughs> so we did it over Zoom. And their family was there. Her grandparents were shedding tears, and it was, it was beautiful. It was fine. It was not what they wanted or dreamed of, but they were able to get married. And I did it in my office in gym shorts and a tie, right? It's okay. Like, we got to keep going, guys. Like, we got to keep going in your own lives. And I'm not saying to be reckless at all, but there are some many, many safe ways to keep going and be in the church. There's many safe ways. Don't let this lockdown, and no matter what, even if Michigan says we're doing something crazy, don't let it stop you. We have a chance to be strengthened during this time and come out of this time much stronger than we went in. Amen? And if we just say or live defeated, like we're going to come out just defeated. We're just giving in to the enemy and just saying, well, I'm just going to go into a hole for the next four months. Like, no, that's not, that's not us. And that's not what God has for the church. And so in the, in the last thing before I read our scripture for the morning is, um, we need to minister to others during this time. This has been big on our, my heart and some of our leaders' heart, is like we got to be ministering to each other. So those of us in the church that feel like God's calling us to shepherd the flock, and that's all of us in some way, like we got to keep going and checking in on people. We're talking about starting care teams to like look in on people and keep the ministry of the church going. And so when you come here, you know, and we're walking around like, ask people how they're doing and how you can pray for them and call people in the church, check up on them, and just continue to be the church and minister in that way. You know, I think some people might be asking, well, why are we having even the doors open right now? Well, number one, like we, you know, we, we're doing it in a way that's safe and we're kind of spread out a little bit and mask required when you're not sitting. But I wanted to keep the doors open. I mean, that might change, but I, my heart is to keep the doors open as long as possible because, yes, some of you have very healthy, spiritually solid families, but there's a lot of people at J-Road that live alone. There's a lot of people at J-Road who live in isolation because they're just—that's the, the season of life they're in. There's a lot of people at J-Road who are struggling right now spiritually, mentally, emotionally, and they need— to see a pastor face to face once in a while. And so we want to keep the doors open and um, give you guys that choice. And if it gets, you know, out of hand or something we don't feel like we need to change, we might do that or add a service. But I think we have to understand that the ministry is so important to keep going. And I know some of you are in really good spots in your life, but for many of the church, they're not in good spots. And so is God calling you to reach out to somebody? Is God putting it on your heart to check in on somebody and say, hey, I thought of you this week, I, I, and I'm calling you to just check in. God does that with me, and I know I'm a pastor, and some people think I have to. I'd do it if I wasn't a pastor. Hey, God put you on my heart. I want to reach out um, to you and see how you are doing. So, so the fellowship has to keep going, and ministry has to re going, keep going. So again, we're going to create care teams. We want—I might ask you guys to help me— care for people in the church 
if you guys have that heart and you at home too, we just care in different ways and it doesn't have to be in person. Every 12th is going to keep happening. The Christmas store is going to keep happening in a safe way. Um, but the, chur- the church is never going to shut down. I want to say that and be like really serious about it. Even if we go totally virtual, by some chance, we have to go totally virtual or we decide to, the church doesn't have to shut down. So we never, like, let's erase that language from our language, is like, the church is shut down. When we say that, we say that we stop being the church. We might say that we are going, the service is going virtual for a season, but we are never called to shut down, amen? Like, you guys are never called to shut down. Look different, yes, stop, never, okay? Okay, awesome. So, we are doing baptisms this morning, and we will do them in about 10 minutes, but I want to read this story real quick for you guys. This story is in the New Testament, and so we're taking a break from Acts because I feel like we're on a little bit of a detour in all of our lives, so maybe we should just do this a little bit different. And we have Baptism Sunday, so we, if you brought your Bibles, we're in the book of Acts, but also they'll be up on the screens for you, in those screens in the back if you didn't bring your Bibles. Um, we're going to be in Acts chapter 8, and this is a baptism story, and one of my favorite stories in the Bible, and it's with Philip. It's Philip the Evangelist, as they call him. It's not Philip the Apostle, but it's Philip the Evangelist. And um, he shares the gospel with this Ethiopian, the Ethiopian eunuch, as they call him. And he was part of the royal Ethiopian court. And I, I just want to read this and give you a word this morning, and then we will baptize some folks into the family of God. Amen? Amen. Awesome. Let's read Acts chapter 8, verse 26 through 29. It says this, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Candake, which means the queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem, the Ethiopian, to worship. And on his way home, he was sitting in his chariot, reading from the book of Isaiah, the prophet. And the Spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Okay, so Philip was led by God from Jerusalem out into the desert, okay? And so when you study this verse, there's some undertones. Like you might see like he went down this road. When you study this verse in its entirety, God told Philip to go from Jerusalem— down the road south, almost out into the desert. And so this seemed like it could be a weird request from the Holy Spirit. Like, why are you having me go out here? And it seemed like an odd request. It didn't make sense. Why? Why did it make sense? Because at the time, the ministry happened where the people were, right? Where was the people at that time? They were in Jerusalem. They were all in Jerusalem and Samaria, and they were in there, and they were—that's where the concentration was. And that's where Philip the evangelist was, sharing the gospel. And he was there. And God told him, I want you to go away where all the people are and go out to this road that actually leads to the desert. And Philip had no idea there was a chariot there. He had no idea there was an Ethiopian there. But he was obedient to God, and he went away, down into the desert. You know, I think there's some cool— parallels between this story and kind of where we're at too a little bit, and I'll explain that in a second. So he sent him out into the desert. God put Philip on a detour. Like, Philip was in Jerusalem doing his thing, sharing the gospel. God put him on a detour. So my question is, has God ever put you on a detour in your life? Has God ever put you on a side journey that you really weren't expecting? in your life had this change in it that you weren't expecting and put you on a detour. And that's what God did to Philip. He put him on a detour. And this detour had an opportunity for him to share Jesus with someone. The state the church is in for the next month or so, in my opinion, is a God-ordained detour. I truly believe it. I believe the first time we were locked down was a God-ordained detour. And, you know, some of us thrived in it, and some of us struggled in it, and we got to learn to adapt and be the church no matter what. And so it's a God-ordained detour for a month or so, and, and 
you know, we think, like Philip did, ministry happens in Jerusalem. And we think ministry happens on Sunday morning. Like, why? Why, I mean, why am I watching from home? Like, why are we doing this? Like, ministry happens here. And God said to Philip, well, ministry could happen out there too. Ministry could happen in your workplaces. It could happen anywhere. It doesn't just happen on Sunday morning. So if we need to go virtual for a season or semi-quasi-virtual, virtual hybrid as I came up with the word, and I, nobody gave me any credit for making such a great word up. No other, thank you, Bridget, again. The other pastors in Muskegon can learn a thing from my vocabulary. Virtual hybrid. No, I, I tr I'm going to trademark that, by the way. Um, yeah. <laughs> but not only that, like, God is putting the church on a detour, and we might think, why is he taking us away from where the ministry is? And God's like, ministry is still going to happen, and I'm still going to use it to make it happen. And so the church is on a detour. And if we're using the road analogy, I believe this season is a detour— it's not a roadblock. When we look at this season as a roadblock, we're tempted, and maybe out of depression or out of just being angry at what's happening in the world, we could throw up our hands and be like, I'm taking a holy break for like six months, and we don't do anything. That would be a roadblock. I don't believe God gives his church a season of just stopping. He gives his church a season of detour, looking different. And with the detour, there's opportunities. If it's a roadblock, you become frozen, stuck. God doesn't give his church seasons of doing absolutely nothing. He gives them seasons of change. We do have rest. Everybody should be taking a day of rest in their week. But this season might be a detour. And so we need to ask, what is God teaching us in this season? So let's look at the next verse. Philip went down. He saw the chariot. Verse 30. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. The guy was reading from the Old Testament, the book of Isaiah. And, he's, and Philip asked him, do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked, how can I, he said, unless somebody explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. And this is the passage of scripture the, the eunuch was reading. So this is the verse in Isaiah. It, it's a prophecy of Jesus. And just so happens the Ethiopian is reading this prophecy of Jesus, and it says this. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shear is silent. He did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. Again, that's a prophecy of Jesus' death. Um, and it's a famous prophecy of Jesus' death, and Philip knew that. In verse 34, the... Ethiopian eunuch asked Philip, tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about? Is he talking about himself or is he talking about somebody else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and he told the good news about Jesus. So he, so he went on this detour. God often offered him an open door to share the gospel. And if you guys are in the habit of evangelizing and sharing the gospel, like this is a tremendous open door because he just had to be obedient to God and God opened the doors for him to share the gospel. And so he said, who is this person talking about? And then Philip preached to this man. He, he shared Jesus with this man. Phil, Philip wasn't, okay, and I truly believe this, like he, he wasn't, to make this interaction— he didn't have to be the smartest man. He didn't have to be the most clever man. He didn't have to have the most insane linguistic language to be, the, like, clever enough to— ch He didn't have to be Ken Ham, if you guys know who Ken Ham is. He just had to be where God wanted him to be and willing to walk through the open door God gave him. So God put him on a detour, and God gave him an open door. And so— the second question is, or the second thing during the season of detour is, look for the doors God is opening for you. Look for the doors that God is opening for you. If you sit and get depressed and do nothing, like you won't see the doors that are God is opening for you in this season. And, and, and we have to look at this as a detour, and God is going to show us where he wants us. And, and we have to look for those open doors. So over this next season, the church is going to look different. And so we need to look for open doors. Does God put somebody on your heart? That could be the Holy Spirit telling you to reach out to them and call them. I, you know, 
we talked about this, like we have opportunities to do this safely over phone and over Zoom. We shouldn't let COVID be an excuse to stop being the church. Okay? I'm going to say that again. We shouldn't let COVID be an excuse to stop being the church. I'm not saying be irresponsible, and I'm not saying be reckless, but there are so many tools we have where we can minister and we can be the church, where it doesn't have to stop, where it doesn't have to, like, continue. But there we have tools we have to love people and love our community in a way that looks totally different. So God is going to give you plenty of open doors. We just have to be willing and open to look for them. And during this time, I might call you and tell you about an open door of where you could serve in the church. Or maybe one of the elders call you and ask you to step up, and we might ask you to help out with that as well. And so again, Philip goes out of Jerusalem. He goes on a detour out to the desert, finds the Ethiopian, shares Jesus with him. And then this is the last part in verse 36 through 38. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, Look here, some water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? And Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And the eunuch answered, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. In verse 38, And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. So God put him on this detour. He shared Jesus with this man, and then he baptized him all in the same thing. Like, they didn't wait. Like, they just saw the water, and they baptized him. And, you know, and that's how it happened. This detour that seemed like a roadblock really turned into a great opportunity. With the church, many people will use the language. Maybe if they don't go to j Road, they go somewhere else, and they'll use the language. The church is shut down. Oh, yeah, my church is shut down. I am asking us as a church, we take that out of our vocabulary that the church is shut down. Even if we are, like, mostly virtual for a season, we're not going to use that language, right? And it's, we're just going to take that out of our vocabulary. Because I believe God is using this time to put us on a slight detour where church has to look different, and it's really going to grow us in different ways. And amazing doors are going to open ahead. So my question is, Will you commit to being the church during this season? Will you commit to not shutting down your faith, even if the community shuts down? Will you commit to just keep moving forward and advancing the church, even if things look totally different? And if you do, God will open us up some amazing doors, new opportunities and relationships, and after we get through this season, which I believe we'll get through this season, Jericho Road Church will be stronger. We'll have healthier relationships and, like, stronger bonds. And the gospel will have advanced during the season and not just slowed down to a halt. Because it can't. It really can't. I think there's one thing we learned from the first time is the gospel cannot stop. Amen? Amen. And I trust if you're watching online, you just type amen if you have that ability, if you're not watching from the TV. Um, and I do go through and read your comments, by the way. So if you say something negative, I do see it later. Just kidding. Nobody does. Um, so it's going to look different. So I'm going to pray, and then I'm gonna, we're going to go into baptism. And this is really an exciting part for all of us, because baptism is where somebody steps into the family of God. It's, it's, a, it's, a, step of, it's a step of obedience and what baptism means is, as you know, people go underwater, and then they come back out. It's a symbol of Jesus' death, where he went in the grave, and then he came out and rose three days later on Easter. It's a symbol of his death and resurrection. And when us, the church, gets baptized, we are identifying in this baptism. So we're saying we, are, we died with Christ— with our belief and trust in him as our Lord and Savior, and we are going to raise again that when we die from this earth, it's not the end, that there is a resurrection where we get to spend eternity with him in heaven. And it's our way to share that with the church. So it's a very exciting time. So those of you that are here and even online, I want to hear you guys clapping when somebody gets baptized because the Bible says when one person repents and comes to Jesus, the angels in heaven throw a party and celebrate. And so we're going to do that here on earth as well. So let me pray. God, we love you so much. And 
thank you for the story of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. And God, um, as you put J Road on a detour, I, I personally have a tendency to pout about it for a season and just say, man, I, I hate having to do changes. But God, help me not pout about the changes that have to be made. Help our church not pout about the changes that have to be made and those online. Help us see this as an opportunity to be the church in creative ways, Lord. Help us not see it as a church shutting down, but as a church adapting and doing ministry totally different. God, you have a calling on each one of our lives. And that calling doesn't begin or end with watching a video or sitting in a pew. It begins and ends with us living out our God-giving calling to be the church, to help the single moms, to help the widows, to help the poor, to help the people that are without a job, to help our neighbor that's scared right now and they don't have a hope, and we have a hope and we can share that. It's to be that coworker that is just freaked out right now that we could be a voice of love. And God, help us to be the church in all of these different areas this week. Show us the open doors to walk through, Lord. So God, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Thank you. So Pastor Brian's going to come forward and baptize. And um, yeah, I might pop up for a second to read a testimony here at the end. All right, we got, we got four people um, about to get baptized. And... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in and test the water out for you guys. It's cold. It's fine, though. It's fine. Um, so the, there's nothing... There's nothing supernatural um, about this, this thing, okay? Um, but the symbol of, of what baptism is, is you publicly telling telling your family telling your friends telling the world and saying look um, I my past was terrible I lived that way but you know what I'm going to officially say I'm following Jesus okay so when someone gets dunked in here and comes back up it's a representation of what Jesus has done for us right he died for us and rose again for us and gave us new life all right so that's what baptism is. That's why it's so special. That's why it's so symbolic, okay? Uh, because it, it just represents everything that Jesus has done for us, and it represents what you are going to do for Jesus, right? Not, around, not about the people around you, but what you personally are going to do for Jesus. And honestly, you could be such a such a example of who Jesus is towards the people who are watching today. Um, and so uh, we got four people. Uh, what, the first one, um, I'm going to enjoy this one very much uh, because he, he's, he's one of the first students uh, that, that I was able to just, just be with, um, talk with, uh, if he talks at all, right? Uh, if, you've, if you've ever been a youth leader or anything like that, you know students don't talk to you. They give you like two words. Um, and so I'm going to call up Caleb. Um, he's a high school student who, who comes here, and, and he's been coming to, to our student ministry for a while now. And uh, I'm just going to have a pleasure of just, just doing this. Um, and so... <sighs> Oh, you going? You going shoes in? Okay, man, he's all. <laughs> hey, you want to take your socks off? You sure? All right, all right. <laughs> is is there a good angle? I think this is. What's the best angle here for you for you guys? This is good. Okay. Um, hey, introduce yourself. Uh, I'm Caleb. Hello. Why do you want to? Why do you want to get baptized today? I want to 
want to grow in my relationship with God. Awesome. Cool. <laughs> I'm going to ask Caleb two personal questions. Um, I won't have the mic. And then, uh, guys, cheer. Cheer for this because this is a special moment. This is a moment to celebrate because this guy's going to be a son, a, a child of God. Uh, okay? So. Next one up is uh, Aiden. As he's coming up, um, Aiden actually uh, approached us and was like, hey man, I want to be baptized. Uh, had a conversation with him. Um, wants to follow Jesus. Loves the gospel. And uh, yeah. Aiden, why, why do you want to get baptized? I just want to further my relationship with the Lord and Jesus. The next one, uh, this one's going to be, we're not going to dunk in this next one, uh, but can I call up Jack? We are literally, we're going to pour some water on his head, okay? Same symbol, same meaning.
Amen, Jack. The next up is Jack's daughter, Barb, is getting baptized. And she asked that I would read her testimony for her um, for various reasons. But sometimes it's hard to share without, you know, some people. <laughs> These are hard things to share. But here's Barb. And this is what her testimony says. This is what I said to my sister on the day that I truly realized I wanted to be baptized. I was listening to the radio station, 99.3. It is called Uplift and is a Christian music station. I was taking a ride in my Jeep and it got me thinking. Since the death of my soulmate, Bud, I've been feeling empty, lonely, and like I really don't know what my purpose is. I first thought my reason for everything was my kids, and I understood that although they will always be an important part of my life, they will leave in a few short years as adults. I also realized that my life will not end when this happens, but I will continue on a different path, one that I need the Lord in to be the Lord to be in. I felt that I was not listening to him when he was moving me towards baptism. When Bud passed, I, I had a sadness and, and I had a fear because I did not know exactly where he went. I do not want my children or grandchildren to carry that burden when I pass on. God wants me to be baptized so I can show all my kids that they don't have to fear and they don't have to cry when I pass away. Because I am definitely going to heaven. While I'm still alive, it is my responsibility to be the Lord's disciple for my kids and grandkids. If I do, if, if I do lose one of them before I go, I am praying that I do not, and I'm praying I do not. My job is to make sure that they all know about God and about Jesus, that they, that they can ask God into their heart and they can be baptized if they wish, and I can show them what a daughter of the Lord looks like. That way, if something does happen to me, I will have that peace in my heart of knowing that they are in the Lord's care. If something does happen to one of them, I have that peace. I am so excited because I have felt lost for so long, stuck in my grief and confused about the world and my place in it. And I know now, I know now what I am supposed to do and why I am still here. Baptism is the way to proclaim my love for him, my vow to turn my life to him, to allow me to follow his path. It is the very first step of many in my journey. Give it up for Barb. Pastor Jim said, right, the corona is not going to stop life change happening. Yes. So don't let it do that. Okay? Whatever you can to continue furthering the gospel of Jesus, please do that. We have every single tool given to us, technology, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, represent Jesus in your life, okay, whether that's in person or virtually. Don't let life change stop. That's what the gospel does. Jesus pivoted, so will we. All right? So, yeah. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you guys for everybody that is watching online. And again, this water is really cold, so these people really love Jesus. That's why I want to give you guys that assurance. Uh, <laughs> thank you guys for being here this morning. And um, thank you guys for watching online. This concludes our service. I love you guys. Go out and be the church.